morning, morning first, first friends. friends. Let's, Let's go, go ahead and stand, stand up. up. Let's sing Let's raise a hallelujah together.
coordinator here at First Pres, and we're so glad that you're here this morning. There's something really exhilarating about a new year, and for this year, a new decade. And so thank you that on the first Sunday of this new year, new decade, you're here with us, either on Facebook Live or here in person. And whether you're here most Sundays or if you're visiting us for the first time, we are so glad that you joined us, and we want this to be a place where you can come as you are. This is a place where you can walk in feeling really, really hopeful for the year, or maybe you're feeling a little bit anxious about the year. This is the place for you to come because you're surrounded by people who are going to care well for you, and you're in the presence of a God who loves you perfectly. Let's pray. God, we give you this year. We give you this morning. We thank you for waking us up and bringing us to this place where we can just be ourselves. God, you have something for us this morning. You have something for each and every one of us. It's not an accident that we're sitting where we are right now. And so, Lord, we just want to surrender to you. We want to say yes to the things that you have for us. We want to be open to the places where you're leading us. Lord, we want to lift up the people in our, our midst who are hurting right now. We think about the Gibbons family and the loss of Mark. God, we just pray that you would surround him and his family for Mark's kids, um, that you would just comfort them as they grieve. Lord, we also pray for the Faircloth family as they enter a new year. Pray that you would surround them, that you would encourage them. Pray for Jackie. Pray that you would meet her right where she is. And Lord, we just give you this year, we give you this morning. And Jesus, we want to pray the way that you taught us.
want to invite you to connect with us. So feel free to connect card coming up. If you are new or if you've had a change in your address, anything like that, you'll find the connect cards in the pew. Uh, please fill it out and pass it. Put it in the baskets as they go around. I believe I'm next. And, and I, I want, want you to, to take, take a notice, notice here, FP 2.0. This is our journey from being in this location to a new location. We've been praying. We've been fasting. We're going to continue to pray and fast. We're getting close to being able to give you an update on the kind of finalists for the decisions. You need to know that teams have been working. There are 12 teams working. They meet all the time. Those teams are also being supervised or guided by a steering committee. We're down to three or four or five possible options for an interim home as well as options for a permanent home, and that's where we are right now today. It's not quite ready to talk a whole lot more about it. If you want to know stuff, we're happy to come and talk to you. If you're on the steering committee, just raise your hand. If you're in the room and on it, any of these people on, on the steering committee can give you an update if you like one. There's somebody up in the balcony. So we're, well, it's a totally transparent process, but it's just all kinds of work. And so the details are phenomenally awesome, gifted group of people making prayerful, good business analysis. Prayerful, good business analysis as well as, well as prayerful and careful future visioning about how we want to go forward. Both of those are happening. You can be sure that all of the decisions are going to be offered to us are being, are being done with all this great trust of God. We don't quite know yet what's going to happen, but soon we'll be able to give you some, fine, some pretty good details. So that's what's going on out there with that, and I think that's what I want to say about that. And the next thing we want to do is draw your attention to Wright's Gourmet House, 253 2038. Call ahead for your sandwich order or come early. This Wednesday night from 6 to 7, children are also welcome. We're providing for them. We're going to work on one word for 2020. We thought it was great. We did one word for 2019. Who remembers their word from 2019? Look at that. I want you to know my word was the best word in the house. My word is presence, not T-S, but S-E-S-N-C-E, -S -S meaning the presence of God. I'm doing it again for 2020. But come on Wednesday night, 6 to 7. We're going to have a bunch of people. We'll have tables. We'll have music to help you, Bible verses to help you. If you'd like, I'll even help find a tattoo artist to put the word on your ankle. Chris, show him your ankle. Hope and love on his ankle tattooed in Greek. Yes! So, so Wednesday night, 6 to 7, we're, we're making this friendly for children as well as for adults. Did I say that one more time? How am I doing? I'll, I'll shut up. Speaking of one word, I thought I'd share with y'all what mine is. My word is imagine. And Ephesians 3.20 says that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we could ask or imagine. And so you can use that in a lot of different ways. But um, in this moment, as we have our worship giving back to God, I would encourage you to imagine what God can do with our small offerings to him. Um, he multiplies them. He makes them bigger than we could even dream, we could even imagine. So thank you for your faithfulness and giving back to him, and he's given us so much. Draw back to 
spend 605 days sleeping and two and a half full days brushing his teeth healthily. He will have sat in traffic for nine full days. Billy hates traffic. And in five years, he will have spent 433 days working. Social media will have taken up 152 consecutive days of his life. He will have walked 3,650 miles and spoken 29.2 million words, hopefully good ones. In five years, Billy will have spent 76 days eating and drinking. Billy loves dessert. Two and a half years out of the five will be spent consuming media with 228 days spent watching TV. Billy is messy. He will have spent 152 days cleaning. And in five years, he will have spent roughly $40,000 on food, 40 days shopping, and 50 days socializing with the homies. Welcome to you. In five years. If, if I, eat I eat like I did, I did the last 60 days, in the next five years, I'm going to spend $120,000 on food. But we're, but we're not, not going to talk, talk about that yet. We're, we're going to talk about what day it is. And today is a day where 11 pipers are piping. Did you know that? Huh? Did you know why this is still up? The real reason this is still up is because the folks that put it up didn't have time to take it down yet. But technically, we're still in Christmas, baby! Yes, we are. You come to my house. The tree is still up. The lights are still up. I'm still embarrassing my wife because tomorrow is the 12th day of Christmas. What happens on the 12th day of Christmas? I've got to my notes. 12 drummers drum, 11 pipers pipe, 10 lords leap, 9 ladies dance, etc. Why do we say the 12th day of Christmas? Because there's an uppercase E epiphany. It's tomorrow. In fact, if you live in Cuba and you're a kid, right now you're going nuts because tonight's the night. They, they don't, don't do the gifts on Christmas Day. They, they do, do it for Epiphany. Epiphany ends the season of Christmas. And I just want you to know that. And I want you to know that the word Epiphany means appearance because remember there was a star that appeared and three wise guys followed it and gave gifts to Jesus. And all that didn't happen in 12 literal days. But we summarize it every year so that we can remember all the important events in the calendar so we can stay in touch with the work of God in our life and in the world. So that's epiphany. You use the word epiphany, lowercase e, to mean some kind of revelation. So if God shows up and appears in the star, you're expecting to learn something else. So let's do this. Let's let today be a part of epiphany for us in the sense of learning something new because God appears, God shows up in our life. And, and that's, that's what, what I want to do. And the other thing we're not going to do is talk about New Year's resolution, but I want to tell you a good joke. This happened on Thursday morning. It's not really a joke. It's a real thing. This is from the Stichter family. Some of you know Ellen Stichter. Her husband Don died earlier this last year. The great family. Scott is a part of the, great, the best life group in the history of life groups, which meets Thursday morning right before May at 7 o'clock, by the way, for men. So anyhow, Scott says this about a conversation with his mother that happened just last week. Scott, his mother, Ellen, who's 85. Ellen says to Scott, what's your New Year's resolution? Scott says, I'm going to exercise less. Now, you already, if you know the stickers, you see the dry wind in their family. But, oh, we're not finished. Ellen, 85-year-old mother, in response to Scott saying, I'm going to exercise less. And less, Ellen's response Oh, I don't think that's possible. <laughs> Again, we're not talking about New Year's resolutions, but just for fun, who made some? Come on, cowards. Just for fun, who's already violated them? So as I mentioned... As, As I mentioned, mentioned beginning, I think, think officially November 4th, oh, I, let, I, I, I took, took all the filters, filters off. And I've eaten more chocolate, more junk since November 4th. Oh. So on Monday, I mean on the 1st, which was Wednesday, I think, right? I went no sugar. So far, I haven't violated it. No sugar, more water. Woo! It's been hard. But we're, we're going to talk, talk about five years, five weeks, about five years. Who are you going to be 
at the end of 2025. Who do you want to be at the end of 25? That's what we want to think about. We've got a, a series that starts today. It'll end Super Bowl Sunday. Who could I be in five years if I was really serious about it? That's the kind of question we're inviting you to engage in. And I should say this to be clear. You don't make a decision like this. Now, somebody may have a snap kind of thing they're clear about. I would suggest to you, if you're taking this offer with some seriousness, do what you need to do, which is start writing. Start taking notes. Start listening to God's voice inside yourself. God, and it'll just come up. If you sit down in a quiet place, turn off all your media. Get rid of your devices. Sit down with a pen and paper and say, where do I want to be? Who do I want to be? What, what, can I, what can be different in five years if I put serious focus on it? And take notes. And then ask God to guide you and lead you. That's the challenge. That's the offer. That's the prod that the next five weeks is trying to push into us. That's, an, that's what we're hoping to do is say to myself, say to yourself, we say it together as a group. What could happen? If five straight years I put good, serious, hard effort into it, was in K Force Wednesday for a steering committee meeting. And David Dunkel, who runs K Force, also is the point person for the steering committee. There are nine unbelievably gifted people, plus me, on the committee. And so I want you to see this that I saw on the K Force bulletin. I took a picture with my camera. What are you most proud of? And I got to get closer over the last decade. This is just kind of fun. And, and you, you, you may be able to see some of it. Having kids, and right above that, no kids. <laughs> Getting my MBA. Something up over here says, still have my hair. Yeah, there it is, top middle, right next to it. Bought a house, paid off debt. So this is just to get us thinking. Really cool things could happen. It, I want you to realize that your relationship with Jesus Christ is at the center of all of this. But, but you, like these good people, are thinking about stuff that really matters. I'll, I'll just pick one. What, what if you bought a house and in five years you could realize gain in the house and you could sell the house and move into a different house? Wouldn't that be pretty cool if that was a part of what you felt like was happening next in your life? That kind of stuff, serious stuff, good stuff. And this is, oh, it went away, but this is really good kind of reflection. Playful at K-Force. But also, she saw, saw some really serious reflections, some deep gratitude. I graduated from college. And what that would mean in the K-Force environment is somebody who's an adult who didn't finish college at, tr at the traditional age of 22, and they went back to school while they were working, and they finished college. Is that awesome or what? But you know what? If right now today, if you want to finish college, start working on it now, and in five years, you can do it. That's, that's the point of this exercise. But we're, we're going to explicitly on purpose make this a part of our relationship with Jesus because we want to be a force of people as a family who are saying to God, who do you want me to be in five years? And then we do it together. And the next thing you know, we make a difference in our city, in our neighborhood, in our family, in our office, in our classroom. We make a difference because each one of us individually and together, we're out there trying to make a difference that matters to God. And that's the question that we want to be asking. If I was serious about it, what would I be like in five years? Now, one of the things you can do is look back. Take a minute in your imagination. Use balloons if you want to remember your birthday five years ago. January 5th. 2015. And one of the ways of thinking about January 5th, 2025 is to think about the five years that have just transpired. What's different about me today? And did I, on purpose, with God guiding and leading me, God empowering me, did I do some kind of inventory? Did I make some kind of decisions? And did I put the effort into it and was I serious? And the, my, my guess is that there are plenty of examples of yes. So, so let's do it again. But it really it helps to think long term. Here's one of the things I think we do. I think we underestimate what we can accomplish long term and overestimate what we can get done short term. 
But see, it's the slow, steady consistency. It's point number three down here. It's the ongoing, ongoing consistency is much better than short-term intensity. Sometimes short-term intensity is required, but really, over time, it's just showing up for work, so to speak, every day and just plowing ahead. And so I don't think this is an accident that God wants you to be different and God wants me to be different because God loves me and loves me just as I am, but loves me too much to leave me the way I am. And God wants me to be a better version of who God made me to be. And I am invited by God to participate in that. And that's the challenge. That's the kind of rubric. That's the umbrella under which we want to think for the next few weeks. I think what you want is the same thing I want. I want to be transformed. I really do. God is transforming me, and God wants to continue to transform me. I don't think you'd be sitting here right now if you weren't hungry for some kind of transformational change. That's, that's saying God loves me the way I am, but man, who's God making me into? And I want to be that person. And if your life is like my life, there's stuff that I'm so grateful for, but there's stuff that ain't, just ain't right yet. It's both. And I want the stuff that ain't right yet, if I can, cooperate with God in me, with you. I want the stuff that ain't right yet to be right, and I want the stuff that is working to work even more. Because I want to be five years looking back with gratitude like I can do now about the previous five. And like I hope you will do. Part of what you can do in this process is say thank you for what's happened in the last five years. And I'm looking around the room and I see unbelievable things that have happened in the last five years. Hard things, difficult things, some things that happened to us that we had no control over. But man, God is good. And if we are being invited to participate in that on purpose. And you have to decide, I have to decide, I have to choose, God, make me into the person you want me to be, and let's make it big stuff. Let's make it important stuff. Let's make it stuff that matters to me and stuff that matters to you. So let's look at this text from the Apostle Paul that shows us what life is like when we've begun to say, I want to be the kind of person you want me to be. This, I decided to use the message the message translation, it's a very loose paraphrase. It's not a word for word from Greek to English, but I thought it got a lot of the good ideas over again really well. So we're gonna, I'm going to read through it. I'm going to comment on a couple of things as I go, and then we're going we're gonna to dive further into how to be different in five years. So this is Paul writing to the Christians, the people who are followers of Jesus in the city of Rome. Paul has never met them, but he knows that they've had a dramatic change. Here's what's really the case. Jesus is always inviting people, regularly inviting people to follow him. You with me? Jesus all the time is saying, follow me. And that's what, the, that's what we're doing. We're following Jesus. If you are a Christian, it means what that means is you're a follower of Jesus. Now, these people in Rome were not followers of Jesus. They were followers of other stuff. They had all these gods, and they were followers of that. And then they, they met Jesus. And they started following Jesus. And Paul wants to go to Rome, and he's writing a letter to them ahead of time. That's one thing. The other thing you need to know is they were a distinct minority in Rome. The followers of Jesus were a distinct. Her name is Rita. She's so nice. We baptized her. She's already a baby, baby, baby follower of Jesus. Because her mom and dad are followers of Jesus. And her brother and her sister are followers of Jesus. Paul's friends that he's never met in Rome were getting their teeth kicked in. Because you don't say around the emperor of Rome, Jesus Curios, Jesus is Lord. You don't say that. Caesar Curios. If you say Jesus Curios, Caesar's boys come after you. It's that simple. There was only one boss. It was Caesar Augustus, not Jesus of Nazareth. So the followers of Jesus who are a distinct minority in the city of Rome are getting their teeth kicked in for being believers. But Paul reminds them that the resurrection is a real thing, and that's the basis of everything we say and do. And then he gives them this kind of practical advice about life lived as followers of Jesus in any world, but certainly in the world of Rome, which was to them spiritually a hostile environment. 
Make sure that you don't get so absorbed and exhausted in taking care of all your day-to-day obligations. That's about the intensity of the present. That's about overestimating what I can accomplish in the right now and underestimating what I can accomplish over a long period of time. Don't get so exhausted. Does anybody feel exhausted already? (sighs) Don't do that. You lose track of the time and doze off, oblivious to God. So I'm going to pause and give you a, a brief Greek lesson. See the word time up there. In Paul's mind are two words for Greek, in, in Greek for, for time. Chronos, from which you see the English word chronology. Chronos is the word you would use if you were just talking about time, like it's 10 o'clock now, it's going to be 11 o'clock, and then 12 o'clock, it's just counting time. Kairos is the word here. And kairos means a special point in time like an opportune time, a time that's full in a way that chronos isn't. Example, last night, Kathy conducted a wedding. I was in the the crowd watching. I guarantee you that the bride and the groom and the mom and the dad of both and the family members, they were not chronos here. Oh, no. Kairos, nervous. If you have to give a talk publicly, most of you are very kairos when you're about to give that talk publicly. Right? It's It's not just another event. event. When When you're you're standing standing up in front front of people, any number of things. If you are Tom Brady, last night was Kairos. was not Kronos. Anyway, I had to get a sports reference in. Where was I? Oblivious to God. In other words, we get so busy doing the little stuff that's right now. And then he says, the night is about over. This is still about time. Paul is using night and day to talk about the inbreaking of God and God's goodness, which we know is true clearly for Paul, clearly for you, clearly for me. Night is being interrupted with new light because of the cross of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. That's why we leave the star in here. That's why these lights are still on. So Paul is saying, don't doze off. Don't be oblivious to God. The night's almost over. Dawn is about to break. Be up and awake to what God is doing. In other words, don't put it off. Don't delay. Don't say, well, it's going to be okay down the road so I can goof off now. Here's what Paul is saying. He's saying, I don't know when it's going to happen, but it could happen any time. So, friends, what we've printed here in front of you is time ain't on your side or mine. Don't procrastinate, Paul is saying. Get started now, engaging in the fullness of God's long-term work in your life. The guarantee that God is at work is the resurrection of Jesus. It's what we celebrate here. When we eat and drink, what we're saying is I am depending on and putting my whole life on the certainty of the resurrection of Jesus. That's a part of the meaning of the table. Your past is forgiven, guaranteed. Your future is secured. That's what's happening here. And what Paul wants us to do is not hesitate, not delay, not procrastinate. Engage. Because we don't know when God is going to do it. It could happen any time, but God is going to make it all come together in Jesus. These people are hurting in Rome. They're getting bashed. They're literally running for their lives because they're in a hostile cultural and political environment. You and I don't have that. But I guarantee you there are mega forces on your life right now that would would take you anywhere but the presence of Jesus Christ. The forces that are on us in our culture want to do everything to get us away from the presence of Jesus. We say we don't have time. We say we're busy. We say we've got a lot of work to do. And we do. But all of that can be, if we're not careful, a lie. Because nothing matters more than being secure in the presence of Jesus Christ. In his presence. With him. on Him on our minds. Him in communion with us. Again, there's the table. So Paul is telling these great people in Rome who are brave. Why are they brave? Because, not because they're special. Because they keep trying to make Jesus Christ the center of all their reality. Don't delay, he says. Oh, I didn't finish that last sentence, Mike. God is putting the finishing touches 
on the salvation work he began. God is at work in you. He, you're not what you were. You're not what you're going to be. And God is at work in you. That's the truth about us individually, and that's the truth about God's work in the world. In other words, there's a day coming. We don't know when, but we could, it could be any time. And that day is when Jesus Christ sweeps back into our world and makes everything right again. It's like the Garden of Eden on steroids good. That's coming. God is not going to obliterate the universe. He's going to make it whole and healed again. There will be no more cancer. There will be no more anxiety. There will be no more alienation and estrangement. Everything will be right. When is that day going to come? If you're in Rome and you're a follower of Jesus, you're going, man, could it be tomorrow? Please accept it wasn't tomorrow for them. It's obvious because we're 19, 20 uh, decades, uh, centuries later. So there, all we go, one more, one more slide. We can't afford to waste a minute again in the sense of urgency, not like something's going to bad happen. Don't mean urgency in the sense of anxiety. I mean urgency, why, why wait? Let's just get on with it. Let's get on with being close. Now, then we get a couple of really basic, we get three pairs of basic pieces of advice. Watch what they are. Don't squander these precious daylight hours in frivolity and indulgent, in sleeping around. And in dissipation. Dissipation, by the way, means frivolous, frivolously wasting money or energy or time on things. He's saying, don't do this stuff in bickering and grabbing everything in sight. You see, those are short-term hustle kind of stuff. No, don't do that. Get out of bed using the day-night analogy. Quit slumbering. Quit frivolously wasting time. This is sort of like, for me, quit sitting around in your flannels and watching sports, <laughs> which is what I'm going to do this afternoon, by the way, because we have two football games and I'm going to watch them both, unless they get boring. Some, sometimes I think what I do is just turn everything off, and it's if I'm just wearing clothes that are easy to wear, baggy sweatpants, doing nothing. And it's different from resting. It's just sort of going, oh, it's, I, don't, I don't even want to think about anything anymore. We all do it. And he's saying, I get it. But get up. Wake up. Day is coming. Be ready for it. And the way we're going to get ready for it, you and I are, is we're going to agree to prayerfully build a list of things that if given serious effort in five years, who could I be? Because you know what? You're here. You want to be transformed. I'm here. I want to be different. I want to be more what God made me to be in five years than I am today. And believe me, with deep gratitude, I am way more of who God made me to be today than I was in 2015. I really am. Paul goes on, don't bicker, don't fight, to grab everything, get out of bed, don't loiter and linger, waiting until the very last moment. Dress yourselves in Jesus. Now, what Paul means by that is this. He means attach. In the Gospel of John, chapter 15, it says, Abide or remain in me, like a piece of fruit connected to a vine. Attach yourself to Jesus. See, this is not self-help. That's not what this is. Certainly, we will be different, but we're different not because we can help ourselves. We're different because all of it is based on the reality of the resurrection. And there's God at work in the world, and God at work in our lives, and God at work in our families to make us a force in Tampa, to make you a force in your home, in your school, in your job, in your family, with your friends, socially. God is at work in us. This is not self-help. This is surrender. It's the opposite of self-help. And the way we know that God's at work in us is we attach to him. The table is one way. Engaging daily, pushing away the lies that say, I don't have time. With other friends and groups, privately, with reading the scripture, maybe you use the music that we sing you, which is a set list for today, and you go and listen to that. It's music this morning is awesome. And you use that to help you encounter and worship. This is not self-help. Certainly, you're going to be asked by God to engage your gifts and talents, ability, your volition, your strength, and you use what you have. But it's God driving, directing, enabling, empowering. 
And that's the mystery of being a follower of Jesus. Somehow I realize, man, I'm different, but I didn't do it. I'm different by the grace of God. Oh, this is just awesome. That's what we're here for. There's an upshot to all of this five weeks, and I'll, it's printed right here. It's in a box. So I'd invite you to take a look at it. It might not be crystal clear to get started, and I work with the language. I've decided this is the language we're going to roll with. So it's for five weeks. This is what we're doing. The ways that you let in become the ways you are set in. And again, it's not self-help. But if you become a person attached to Jesus, to use Paul's language, to dress yourselves in Jesus, over time you're letting Jesus in. And guess what? That's who you become. That's who I become. This is, this is more than just habit, although it's true. It's, it's horse sense. This just is common sense. This is about habits. But what we want to do is people who let in the work of God, guiding our commitments, our goal setting, and then that's who we become. So that's, we're just going to, this is what I, another analogy that will make this helpful. I want this decision process that we're beginning now to be an acorn. And I want for me and for you and I want for us as a family, I want it to grow into a grand oak. An acorn, I want to become an oak in my own life. By setting some commitments and by trying to pay attention to them because I'm paying attention to Jesus. What if you made a list of stuff and you wrote it down? So I, I have my list. Now I stand up here talking and I want you to know that I am fully engaged in what I'm asking you to do. But this, by the way, is the FP 2.0 prayer card that we published a long time ago, and it's with me all the time. This is my journal. And if in truth and lending, full disclosure, I've made a promise to myself and to a group I'm getting coached in that I would write in my journal, write with my hands in ink every day. Oh, I'm not doing all that good writing every day. Two days a week for sure, sometimes three, sometimes four, but I'm sitting in the dark down at the YMCA in my car, and I just haven't figured out how to write in the right way. And anyway, I'll get it. I'm on my way to five days a week writing. So I, I thought that it would be okay for me to just tell you some of what's on my mind about who do I want to be in five years if I give it serious effort. You with me? Is that okay? You okay with that? So I got, I got sideways here sort of as an envelope. I want all of this to be framed in the context of loving relational discipleship. What I mean by that is I love me well, I love you well, we follow Jesus well, and we are fundamentally, irretrievably, relentlessly relational. Why? Because that's how Jesus did it. How did he do it? He loved people. He was in relationships with people. That's the kind of person I want to be. It's a lie to think other stuff is more important than relationship. But I buy the lie every day. So I got that sideways sort of help you remember. I want to be a part of us, I said here, and I want us to be a force. That matters. Don't, Don't you want to be a part, part of a force that matters? Heck yeah. yeah. I want people to have to miss us if somehow we went away. Because we're loving people well and making differences that matter. So, so I wrote a few other things that are kind of more individualistic now. You, you can, can guess the first thing I wrote was fitness. I guess it's because I was thinking about $120,000 worth of sugar in the next five years and the last 60 days not going well. But I'm doing okay right now. I wrote, I wrote next Kathy. No, I'm not. not there's, there's nothing else written next to her. I'll just keep thinking about it, trying to be open to how I can be and should be and want to be with my wife. I wrote down next my two sons and my two unbelievable daughters who are married my sons and their children. And again, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do with it. I wrote down my family in St. Augustine. I wrote down giving. And what I mean by that is me being generous with my money. I wrote down, y'all can laugh at me, Hebrew. So I, I realize there's there five people in the entire state of Florida who care about reading biblical Hebrew. I'm one of them. And every year I keep saying I'm relearning my Hebrew, and every year I don't do it. So I'm already <laughs> sure I'm not going to do it. But I wrote it down. Okay, here's the most vulnerable one that I'm going to give you. Anxiety. 
Anybody got it? So I have my own version of it, and it's a part of who I am. I'm not happy about it. I'm working on it. I'm working on it very intentionally, but there it is. And I'm not sure how all that impacts me. Some of you have told me occasionally how you think it impacts the way I relate to you. I appreciate that. If you love me, you'll tell me. And if you love me and don't tell me, it doesn't mean you don't love me. But if you really love me and you feel comfortable about it, come tell me. I, anyway, I wrote down balanced budget. And I, I'm, our budget, by the grace of God, is balanced, Kathy and I. So, so that's a little bit about me. I want you to just see this. So I said that time is not on your side. And what I mean by that is kairos. What I mean by time is kairos, meaning God is at work, and now is an important time. Now, I realize that I come into church on Sunday morning, and I'm in kairos because I stand up and do this. And I always have the pregame jitters. And I, I, want, I want this to be something that's helpful to you. And I work really hard on it. We have a sermon team, and we work hard on this stuff. So for me, Sunday morning is a kind of kairos. But for most of it, it's usually chronos. But chronos is good. Kairos is not better than chronos. It's just different. But I want you to see the kairos opportunity that you're being asked to consider by the Apostle Paul and by me right now. And that is to say to the Almighty God of the universe who loves you, Jesus, if I put serious effort into it, who do you want me to be in five years? Make it a moment now of decision. And I've suggested this is not a decision that happens quickly, but the, but the drive to make the next four or five weeks kind of a kairos season. Because I, it won't happen accidentally. It won't happen because of loitering or slumber or sloth. It only happens when we say, I am going to engage, and I want to be different, not self-help, the different person God wants you to be. There's a really cool dynamic that I want to remind you of. The people in your family, the people in your school, the people you work with, the people your buddies who you hang out with, they're watching. You're watching them. They're watching you. And if your life starts to change, oh, they're going to notice. And it's relational. It's not preaching at people. Over and over again, I tell you that I think that all of us need to be sharing our lives of faith with people. And I think every one of us almost thinks that means I've got to be an expert in the Bible and hit strangers with Bible verses. No! How do we do it? The way Jesus did it. Relentlessly, endlessly, lovingly relational. You just engage with people in normal, everyday ways. And over time, I promise you, when God makes changes in your life, people who are watching will notice. Sometimes they'll be puzzled. How great is that? I don't have to be this unbelievable super person. I just listen carefully to God, and I'm always ready to participate in a conversation and have something to say. Ready to participate, ready to listen, two ears, one mouth, but always ready also to have something to say. If you're not ready to have something to say, then work on it. And again, it's in a loving context with people you care about. It's not about bashing strangers. I, Jesus didn't do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to tell you to do it. That's really kind of a cool thing that happens when our lives change. The people we care about, the people we work with, the people around us, they notice. And some of them are going to say something, I promise you. The other thing that's sort of bullet pointed here that I wanted you to see is number two. <laughs> I'm laughing. Um, the future you is simply an exaggerated version of the present you. You can smile. But you know what? The present you is awesome. The present me is awesome, not because I'm awesome, but because God made me. You are a masterpiece. And God wants you to be an even more exaggeratedly good masterpiece. Because he loves us too much to not die for us, but he also loves us too much to leave us where we are. He's on the move. Jesus Christ is on the move in your life, in our family, in the workplace, in school with the buddies you hang out with, I promise you he's on the move. He wants you and me to be a force in the world that he loves. He loves it so much that he died for it. Jesus Christ loves you, loves your colleagues, 
loves your peers, loves your neighbors, loves your rivals so much that he died for it. And that's what's going on right here in this. The resurrection of Jesus has already happened. And therefore, Paul can say to us, don't hesitate, don't wait, launch. But the past, forgiveness, guaranteed. But the future, secured, because God is going to make everything right again. The Garden of Eden on steroids. And when we eat and drink of this, what we're saying is, I'm deciding to be all in. I want you to make me into the person you want me to be five years from now. And, and go to work on it. So I'm going to step down to the table. I'm going to remind us of a couple of things about what's happening here in front of us. And then we're going to celebrate together what it means to be people who are made by Jesus Christ to be what we are and to be more. And I'm also going to put this basket on here, which is just a reminder to help you do it. So if you didn't take one of these home in the last two weeks, take one home today. But now it looks like we're eating matches and confetti. <laughs> Friends, the body of Jesus, when he was with his closest followers, who were his leadership team, his senior leadership team, we call them disciples and now even apostles, he said to them, this is my body. It's broken for you. It is the guarantee of forgiveness. The past is gone. And then he took the cup, and that cup would have had wine in it. This cup has grape juice in it. And he said, this cup is my blood, which will be spilled for you. It is the certainty, the security of your future. You and I, friends, when we eat and drink, what we're saying is, I'm going to trust you, Jesus Christ, to make me into the person you want me to be. Serious effort. Who will you make me to be? And I'm going to think five years out. Not 12 months out, not one month out. You may not even be certain that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. If so, come and talk to me about it or somebody else. This is the table for Jesus' followers. Friends, this is not a Presbyterian table. It's the table of the Lord. Eat, drink, be grateful. Make this a kairos, an opportunity moment, a decision moment. A moment where you turn it over, you surrender to what it is that God wants to do in you and with you in the next five years. Celebrate new life in Jesus Christ.
right knee. For the blood of Jesus, your future is secure.
please pray with me. Gracious God, we are your people. And there's a moment, a kairos, where you ask us to decide. We focus in, we pay attention. And what we're paying attention to is your love for us, your decisive victory against all that's wrong and evil in the death and resurrection of Jesus. And we can be new people, not because of anything we are, but because of what you have done. The past is paid for, the future is secure. We can start right now being the person, surrendering to you, living close to you, abiding in you, attaching ourselves to you. That's who we want to be. People that make a difference for you in your world because of you. Thank you, gracious God, as we sing, as we celebrate. You've loved us, you take us as we are, and you love us into a new place. That's who we want to be, that's what we want to be about. We celebrate and we sing in the name of Jesus, the one who rescues us and makes us over again into transforming people in your world. Amen.
because of the resurrection, pure hearts, clean hands, good grace, good God. Decide. Amen. Amen.